Hey guys, this is Nate with the Tackle Time Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. You are about to listen to an interview I did with Buddy Signer of Fishing Stories. And he has a really interesting story with a really interesting mission that you should definitely take a look at and think about contributing to. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot more here in the episode, so I think you'll get a lot out of it. And I think a lot of people in this audience will really understand and appreciate the work that he's trying to do. One thing before we dive right into it, check out TackleBuys.com before you buy Tackle the next time you need to restock your fishing box. If you need lures, baits, crankbaits, worms, whatever it might be, the next time you're ready to go buy Tackle, go to TackleBuys.com and look and see what's on sale. Tackle Buys compiles all the best listings of all the sale equipment that's online all the time. There's thousands of different listings. You can search for whatever gear you want, whether it be a crankbait or Z-Man baits or whatever it is that you're actually for. You're looking for a new rod, a new reel, whatever it is that you're actually looking for, you're going to find it on TackleBuys.com. Don't spend more on tackle than you need. Get out, enjoy the sport, save a little bit of money, and still get the gear you like. Uh, we're going to dive right into this interview with Buddy, and it's really fantastic. All right, well, tonight with me, I have Buddy Signer, and I'm super excited to jump in to listen to his fishing background, uh, listen to what he can teach us about fishing, and how we can all become better anglers after talking to Buddy here. So I have high hopes for tonight. So, Buddy, don't let us down, my man. Don't let us down. Please do not. Nate, something I learned a long time ago, high aspirations, low expectations. <laughs> I, will, I, we- I will do my best to bring value to uh, what you're trying to do here so no I appreciate that I know we can expect a lot from you so no that that's perfect uh now now buddy I I learned about you from uh listening to a TED talk which we'll get into here in a few minutes but something that you taught me here was always ask interesting questions so uh, what was your earliest fishing memory that you can remember yeah there's a great question Nate my earliest fishing memory um is uh well obviously when i was when i was a little kid my dad always went fishing with his friends and i always wanted to go and i never really knew why we couldn't go fishing <laughs> because now that i have kids i understand you know you're you're going out with your friends you're not bringing kids along but we would always be looking through his tackle box all the time and just picking out lures and coming up with these awesome things that he should use and we'd go up to him and say dad you need to use this lure this is the one you're going to catch the fish on and not we had no idea he was he was coming to the river to fish for walleye so he's pulling bottom bouncers spinners crawlers whatever he's doing and we're picking just these stupid lures that would never catch a fish and he would always humor us you know he'd always humor us say oh yeah for sure i'll use that one i'll i'll, I'll use that one for sure and uh, I'll catch a big fish on it. But we always got a kick out of that. Every trip he ever took, that was he'd always ask us what he what he should use, and we'd go through his tackle box, and we'd find uh, we'd find what we thought the best lure would be, having no clue what it was or how it worked. And it was just always a fun time for us. So I always loved that. And then another one I got Nate was uh, fishing with my parents with, with our dog, our family dog Sparky. He loved to to catch fish after you threw them in the water so we'd, have, <laughs> we'd go up trout fishing in the black hills of south dakota and we'd catch fish we'd put them on the string stringer and they'd die eventually rigor mortis would set in so they'd stiffen up and we would chuck these fish way out in the water and, and sparky would go out there he'd swim out there and he'd catch the, he'd get these fish sometimes he'd have to dive for them and he'd, and he'd bring them back into shore and that was one of our favorite things to do with with sparky <laughs> oh man clean those trout up and and cook them on the fire uh and uh and enjoy a trout snack in the campground so that was another thing that was one of my favorite things to do out in the black hills that's fantastic so was it your dad that taught you how to fish oh yeah for sure he was he was the one that sparked the fire and he and really the most thing he just took us fishing whenever we wanted to go and we always wanted to go fortunately and we lived in an area that had easy access to other fishing opportunities. I lived right next to a, a stock dam in Rapid City down in Rapid Valley. It was right by the Rapid City Speedway, and it was full of uh, big common carp. Oh, okay. It was, we could ride our bikes over there, and it was on private property, but the landowner was fine with us fishing. Mm. fishing. 
and we would chuck, we would just chuck crawlers and corn and caterpillars, whatever we could find, we'd chuck it out there. And those big commons would, uh, would sometimes pull our rods in the water. We lost <laughs> to, that, to that spot. Um, sometimes they'd break our lines right by shore and all we would have were fishing stories that remain. The fish got bigger every single time we told that story. <laughs> the funnest thing. But yeah, dad was always the one that really took the initiative to get us out camping and fishing. And I think the biggest thing, we always caught fish. So um, that's always better. <laughs> it makes it better. <laughs> when you can catch fish and you can eat fish after the fact, yeah. man, uh, there's, there's really nothing better. So that really sparked the fire. And then I kind of evolved as an angler and I kind of branched off on my own and um, my dad's a bait guy. He fishes bait and I don't, and I don't fish bait anymore. I'm, I'm artificial. I fly fish. Um, you know, I tie my flies and I get more satisfaction from creating a, a lure that looks like something a fish wants to eat and then presenting it in a way that makes them want to eat it. That, that brings sure. satisfaction. And it was just an, a slow evolution as I grew up, you know, as a kid, just kind of advanced onto different things. So it sounds like you started fishing when you were pretty young. Yeah, two years old was when my dad took me wow. for the first time. And I don't remember that trip, but he took me to, he, you know, he tells the story. He took me to Pactola Reservoir on a, an, in November. Wow. Sunny day in November. And, we, and he had never trout fished before. And I had obviously never trout fished before. So we went, we kind of learned together, I guess, in that way. And we caught a limit of trout in Pactola Reservoir in November. That was my first outing. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's basically caught on. I mean, I, as a kid, I would cast lures in, in the street when the, when it would rain after it would rain just to test them out. So we'd have a, we'd have a little drainage area in the street that'd be full of water. I would sit there and cast lures Wow! and just, just test these things out, see how they move, try and catch pieces of ice when it, when it, if it had frozen over, uh, so I was pretty hooked on it, man. I was, I was pretty uh, dedicated to the craft. It sort of sounds like it. Wow. That's, <laughs> I, <laughs> you had a lot of, a lot of experience and a lot of playing around. I think like, like every young kid who needs a, a good hobby does, they try anything and everything and, and some of the worst combinations. But no, that, that's, that's really interesting. Wow. Yeah. You really did start early. That, that's, that's great. Yeah. And back, you know, back then I didn't know that you could make a career out of fishing. Sure. I didn't realize that that was possible. Uh, and that, that's kind of one of, you know, you, you try not to have regrets growing up, but that's one of the things I, I do kind of regret is not realizing that early on that, yeah, you can take fishing or you can take something you're passionate about and make it a career, make it something that actually brings income into your, into your life. Um, and, and, so many people in the fishing world, whether they're fisheries biologists or they're fishing guides, um, television personalities, whatever it may be, they, they are in the fishing world and that's all they do. It consumes their life every day. Um, so I, I, and I wish I would have known that earlier on and because if I had, uh, I, I probably would have went a different route with education and with just pursuing that sport on a whole different level but I just did it for fun and, and, and it turned out okay. It turned out okay for me. I love still doing it for fun. It's a great thing, but um, I would have loved to have a career in the fishing world more so, so than I do now. So would you have gone and to be an educator or would you have went on the path of education for yourself to, to study something, you know, more, more fitting for what kind of where you see yourself going? I would have loved to get into the science ba base uh, the, the science of fishing. Uh, and I did originally go to school to be, a, a, um, a fisheries or I went to a fishery school. I went to Texas A&M at Gal Galveston for marine biology. Oh, okay. And, and I loved it, but, uh, it seemed like the career fields, uh, were not available at the time for, for graduating individuals. And I was brand new and the advisor said, Hey, if you're not if you're not going to dedicate your life to this and, and, you know, you have to understand that you're going to have to really grind it out until you really get to what you want to do. Because I think they really tried to weed out the, the people that, I don't know, that were easy to weed out. I don't know. Sure, because sure. It, was, it was an easy thing for me to just move back and get a business degree. And that's what I did. So I kind of wish I would have stuck out the marine biology thing or, 
or went on to do, you know, uh, fisheries biology. We've got a great fisheries biology school here in South Dakota at SDSU. And, and, uh, and, and I think that is a great avenue for people who want to get involved in the fishing world, just get that education. And then you can go on to do so many different things. I mean, you can go on to guide, you can go on to be an educator. Um, you can go on to be a biologist with the state or with other organizations. And, and there's a lot of different uh, career paths for people in the fisheries world. So uh, that's probably what I would have done. Just, just open so many doors for people. Sure. And two things on, on what you said, you know, one is just, as you said, you're as your counselor or the, the guy that you were talking to said, you know, you're going to have to really grind this out and put the time in. Well, I mean, that's what life is, you know, and, and the reality is, you know, looking back, you and I now could probably see that, well, the, you know, your entire life's about grinding it out and working towards what you want. So, you know, it, you know, obviously hindsight is twenty twenty. You wish you would have known what you, what you know now, or what you know then. So, um, it, it, it's that's a tough call. But no, you're right. Always chase something you know you're you're you always want. So that that's that's good advice for anybody, not even just in fishing. But that that's that's sound advice. And then yeah, too, it sorry, matter, go ahead. it doesn't matter how old you are. You know, I'm, I tell Absolutely. my kids that all the time. You know, the kids got to know. The I I want my kids to know that. Uh, if you are passionate about something, you can, you can make a career out of it, no matter what it is, you can make a career out of doing that. And you don't always have to go to school to do that. You know, you can just start doing it and, and, and then eventually it'll grow into something, um, that can be profitable for you. You know, if you think about it, you go to school, you go to college when you're 19 years old, uh, and you spend, um, 40, $50,000, sometimes more to gain that degree. Yeah. Uh, and then you go out and start making money. Well, if you had spent those four or five years building something, you would probably be better off after five years. Even if you haven't, haven't made any money yet, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be $75,000 or $50,000 sure. in the hole. Yeah. Um, you, yeah, obviously you're going to invest some money to build something. But, you know, if, if you don't make it, you're not out anything after those five years. I'm not saying, you know, you shouldn't go to school and all that, but. Um, if you have something you're passionate about, you might not need to go to school. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> now, there's a lot. There's a lot to be said for for learning from experience and putting the time in, and and always coming out of an experience with some kind of talent or uh, the experience or, or the know-how is really valuable. You're totally right. No, you have something of your own that you've put the time in, and investing yourself investing in yourself is never a bad investment. I don't think you can go wrong. You're totally right. I 100% agree. And there's so many people out there willing to help new people in the world is just it's so easy to find a mentor mm -hmm. you find a group you become a part of that group you um find the smartest person in the room and then you ask them to go to lunch with you you ask them to go fishing with you um you ask them to come and have a have a cocktail on your deck whatever it is you get you get involved with those people and they're going to rub off on you they're going to introduce yeah. you to people who can open doors for you it things just happen when you, when you get your face out in the world, when you get your name out there and you start doing things for people, you start doing things with people, uh, things will start to happen for you. So you, it, it does take time and you have to be there. Lance Valentine's a guide in Michigan. And he, one of his tips for young people is you have to be there. And they yeah. say, what does that mean? Well, it means whatever it's supposed to mean for you. Mm -hmm. You have to be wherever you're supposed to be and you have to be there all the time. Um, and yeah, it's a time commitment, but it, it'll pay off in the end. It, it reminds me of a quote. I think it was, I don't know if it was Einstein, but hard work, it, or I'm sorry, opportunity often gets passed by most people because it, it looks like it's uh, in, I, I'm paraphrasing here, but um, <laughs> overalls and, and look and dressed in dirty work or something of that effect. But, you know, it's just people pass it by because it looks like it's hard. So no, you're, you're, you're right. Absolutely. Well, yep. that, thank you for coming on tonight and trying to be a, a bit of a mentor to all of us listening in. So we definitely appreciate that. And that's exactly what I'm doing here with you. And you were kind enough to, to get dedicate a little bit of your time. And I try and pry a few secrets out of you as far as uh, fishing. And I know you're more than happy to, to contribute in that way. And, and, you know, technology is incredible nowadays. You, you don't even need to have that person down the street. You know, you and I are talking from almost worlds away and you know and you can teach everyone listening an incredible amount of knowledge here so so thank you again really appreciate that well i'm i'm happy to do it nate i appreciate you thinking of me i really do and uh i'm, I'm happy to 
I'm, I'm an educator. I, I teach fly fishing. I teach fly tying. I teach, you know, casting and various other fishing, normal fishing too, spin mm -hmm. cast. So uh, education is near and dear to me. I don't have any secrets. Uh, if I catch fish in a spot, I'm going to tell people about it. If I catch fish on a specific cat or fly, I'm going to tell people about it and say, hey, this is, this is how you do it. This is what you need to do. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to come on here and, and help you reach your mission as well. Did I lose you? Oh, you moved a little bit. Did I lose you there, Nate? Oh, sorry, we're back on. Hopefully we're, hopefully we're back now. Y yeah, I think you did for a second, so hopefully we're back now. Sorry about that. Huh. You hear me? Are we back again? I can hear you now, yeah, for okay. sure. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, you were saying you were an educator and, and you don't hide any secrets, so uh, that, that's, that's perfect. I, I, we need a few more, a few more of you in this community, so that, that's great. Yeah. Now, you mentioned, obviously, as, as going to school for business, you went and created something of yourself where you can be in the fishing world all the time. Can you tell everyone a little bit about what you've created and, and how we can all be a part of it? Because it's really, really near and dear to me. It's really interesting. I'd love for everyone to hear about it. Yeah, the, uh, the Fish Stories Archive is the first online ar uh, library, essentially, dedicated to capturing and preserving angler voices. Uh, so we think of the... We think of the people that have been involved in our lives and we think about the fishing stories that we've created over the years mm -hmm. uh, it's it's really important that we begin preserving those stories for the future because people don't live forever uh, there's influential anglers and mentors that are leaving us every single day so whenever they're gone their wisdom's gone their advice their stories um their their voice is gone forever and uh you're, like you said earlier, technologies come leaps and bounds. Uh, it's so easy for someone to take their smartphone and record their voice on it, record a story. I can sit down with my dad and turn my smartphone on the voice recorder, just push the record button, set it in between us, and then we just start talking fishing. And there I've got a, some awesome stories for the archive. Yeah. Um, and when I play them for my kids, their, their faces light up and they say, hey, it's grandpa. I say, yeah. And they listen to those things. They could listen to those stories for hours. Not there and listen for hours um and and it's it's and all the other people we have, i've got over 400 voices in the archive and the feedback that i've gotten from people is is what really is is so exciting for me you know they mm -hmm. people send me emails saying i listened to my dad's story on the archive and i've downloaded it and we're going to have it forever i can't tell you how much it means to me that to have him on there um i've got people support the archive beat by being a true fan they pay five dollars a month at least five dollars a month to keep the archive growing and sure. uh, and expanding and i've had people become a true fan they say and they wrote in and said i'm doing this in memory of my grandpa because we we don't have his voice we don't have his stories anymore but awesome. i don't want other people to have to miss out on their grandpa's stories forever and and that's exactly why it's around um, and I'm encouraging, I mean, everyone can be a part of it just by recording a story, recording a conversation with someone in your life, um, an angler in your life and, and sending it into, to the archive. It's free. It's free to listen to them. It's free to send it in. And, uh, anyone who wants to support it financially is of course appreciated and that that's the way it's going to be sustainable for the future. Um, but it is and always will be free for the public. It's going to be the largest uh, repository of angler voices in the world at some point and uh, and I'm really excited to watch it grow it's it's kind of something I'm really passionate about and I'm happy to have made it available to the fishing world so so if I understand anybody they don't have to be a member or anything can go online and record a story yeah anyone can record a story and uh, it doesn't matter even if it's not even about fishing it's just about anglers you know it could be your uncle Joe who um, just talking about his life and yeah there's going to be some fishing stories spread in there but you know he might have stories about you know going to war or he might have stories um about meeting his his wife and those are all really important sure so it's not necessarily all about fishing stories 
It's about other things. Uh, one gal on there, Hannah Stonehouse Hudson, she's one of my favorites to listen to. She's from uh, Wisconsin. She now lives in North Dakota. But she, she told stories about her husband, uh, Jim Hudson, who passed away from I, while ice fishing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of her stories are about just, you know, about that experience and about how it's changed her and how, and how her experience could help other people. And so it is, you know, it is about fishing, you know, in a roundabout way, but, um, but just her stories are really powerful and the way she tells them is really powerful and uh, she does a great job. So yeah, that's the purpose. That's the goal. Try and get as many voices. There's 64 million anglers in the United States alone. So if we could get 64 million, ang um, 64 million voices in there, that's, that'd be awesome. That's incredible. Uh, that would cost a lot of money to host, unfortunately, <laughs> but we're going to grow a little slower than that. But ultimately that's the goal. I want every, every angler voice to be in that archive. No, I, that, that means a lot to me. And also I'm sure plenty of people in the audience who, you know, think about their, about their, like my grandpa, he, he wasn't uh, a fisherman for sport by any means, but he was a, he was a fisherman that would go out and catch to feed the family you know they were very poor you know they didn't have a lot of money so that was was something that they had to do but I'm sure he had some good stories to tell and I, and I wish you know he was still around for that because I'm, I'm sure he would be willing to tell but you know and I'm, I'm that's I'm sure that's near and dear to, to a lot of people so that I, I think the work that you're doing is incredible and I'm glad you're doing it that, that, that's really meaningful and even if you know and even if people don't upload it to the archive just having it recorded is important absolutely uh, just taking the time to start that conversation is important because a lot of times I, it's really hard to ask to record someone. And I don't know why it's, it's a really intimate request. I don't know why it is. It is. You're right. It's harder than asking for money. You know, <laughs> it's crazy. When I want to sit down and talk with my dad, even though we've recorded a couple of times already and I know he's willing every time I, I kind of get a hesitation. I'm like, oh, gosh, I don't know if, I don't want to impose on him or I don't, you know, I don't want to make him feel weird, but I know he's okay with it. So I don't, I don't get where that hesitant uh, feeling comes from, but I understand that it is difficult. I've recorded people from all over the world. I've recorded fishing stories. And so if I can do it, anyone can really. <laughs> and that's all people need to, to realize. No, that's fantastic. That's really good. Um, I'm with you here. I think, I think we broke up for just one second there, but I, I heard everything you said luckily. So that's fantastic. No, that, that, that's your, the mission you're doing is great. And I'll make sure to drop links to everything down below where everybody can, can check out fishing stories and they can become a member, hopefully paying members to help support this mission you're trying to, to crusade on. And that's really what it is. It's a, it's a great crusade. It's something powerful. So I'll be sure to drop links and all that for the description below and, and let everybody know where to find it. So that's, that's great. Thanks. Uh, Nate. I oh, absolutely. Now, with that, is there, you said you're a, you teach uh, fly tying and, and fly fishing. Is that something you do only in the local area? Do you travel? Could people, you know, come to you? How does that work? If they want to, you know, want to learn from you. I'm a, I'm an education contractor with our state game fish and parks department. Oh, wow. They utilize my abilities, I guess, to teach other people how to fish and how to fly fish and how to tie flies. So we do a lot of we do a lot of kids clinics. Sure. Uh, we do adult clinics as well. We do big group outings and uh, we have all the gear. We have all the equipment. Uh, and mostly it's in South Dakota. It's with, you know, our, our state is paying for it. So it's, it's mostly within South Dakota's state lines, uh, but we do have people coming from out of state for events and stuff that, that, that join in and, and are a part of it at times. Uh, we have a women's only fly fishing class coming up at the end of the month. It's just something we're organizing on a local level and inviting uh, ladies from around the area and the out-of-staters are welcome too. It's a free clinic and just to become a better angler can learn more wow. about okay. casting and how to do it. So that's the, that, that's the basic gist. We're going to start getting into schools a lot more and teaching kids and families. And uh, that's going to be a really important part of our mission moving forward is the the family experience, trying to get parents and kids involved at the same time so that it's not just the kids trying to take the initiative, it's the parents as well, trying to get the kids out and yeah, they're yeah. All together essentially. And that's kind of what we want to, we want to try and create. Um, and it's not just fishing, it's, it's other things, um, outdoor related. Mm -hmm. 
mostly aquatic education services, what I do. So I'm really passionate about that and really happy for the partnership with Game Fish and Parks to allow me to do that. That's awesome. Wow. And, and, and what you're saying speaks exactly to why I started this project, which is documenting the knowledge and the know-how and the experiences of other anglers in our community. And, and just as you said, you know, as we were talking uh, about fishing stories is, is the people, the mentors of our community of these outdoor communities have, uh, have either a long time ago, they, they quit fishing or they quit hunting or they quit doing those things, but they know it. They know it like the back of their hand. If they could just get back out there and wet a line, they'd be right back in it. Like they never quit and be able to teach so much because of so many tricks they learned or, or little things or how fish behave or whatever the different, what all those, those little things, you know, compounded over a lifetime or incredible wealth of knowledge. And that's exactly what I'm, what my project is, is here to do is to try and break it down and, and speak to people who have it and can, can actually teach those who, who don't know as much like me. I don't know the first thing about fly fishing, but I'm sure I could, I could come to you and learn a lot and take it from step one to step two and, and take it the whole way through. And that's what this project is all about is about documenting that and making it accessible to people who know a lot less and, you know, who aren't experienced. So I, I know exactly what you're saying and I really appreciate your mission. That's fantastic. Yeah. And your, your thing, Nate's going to be really valuable to people. Um, a lot of, a lot of shows nowadays are just, are just kind of talking heads. It's mm -hmm. just, uh, it's just talking about you know, whatever it may be. And again, that's important. All stories are important. All voices are important. But at some, at some point, you know, you have to speak to those individuals who are looking for the very basic level. They're looking for some tips Absolutely. to become better. They're looking for a starting point. Uh, and sometimes that's all you need to break the seal is just that starting point to just spark a fire, catch that first fish, and then it's off to the races. And then they're doing their own thing. They're doing their own research. Eventually, they'll start innovating on their own. Mm -hmm. They'll start yeah. creating on their own. And, uh, and that's when they be, then that's, they'll evolve eventually into an educator, um, at some point and they'll start teaching other people. And so that's, uh, that's what, yeah, you're, you're, you're doing an awesome thing. And it's important to, you're, you're sparking more, more educators, essentially you're creating more education. No, and, no, and I'm, I'm glad you say that because that's exactly what this is supposed to ignite. And just as you said, you know, even the very experienced anglers who, who might know every single thing I could ever know about fly fishing maybe I've never used a spinning rod and a jerk bait, you know, or a chatter bait or whatever. So they might be super experienced in what they use, but they want to expand their horizon a little bit, you know, and kind of need to jump in and learn, learn a little bit of the technique. And that's exactly, it's for anyone and everyone who wants to jump in. And I, I'm sure you have a lot of experience with, with fly fishing. I mean, is that what you wanted to talk to us about tonight as far as any of the gear that you like to use or how you might help us get to the next step or what did you have in mind? You know, the, the piece of gear that I have to feature for you tonight is not necessarily fly fishing related, although um, that's how I use it in, in my pursuits, uh, but anyone can use it, uh, and I would encourage anyone to use it. It's a trick that I picked up. I learned when I was starting off. I learned it from someone else, uh, and I'm just passing on that this tool is something I've acquired into my tool belt. I take it everywhere with me, every fishing trip, regardless of what I'm fishing for. Um, I learned it from a, a, a blog called ginkandgasoline.com. It's a fly fishing specific blog. There's two guys that run it. And uh, they, what they do is, is at the time was totally innovative in the fly fishing world and that they were posting a story or a tip every single day. And they probably still do. Wow. Every single day. I haven't visited their blog for a while, um, but the stuff that they post is, I mean, they're on their own, on their own level, they are accomplished anglers, mm -hmm. but they have a network. They have a network of guides and personalities who have caught more fish in their lifetime than some of us ever will. And so they have them contributing to their, uh, oh, wow. as well. So every single day, it's a really useful tip. And this is something I learned from them. Um, and it's, it's kind of a cool thing. Um, not many people expect it. This is my favorite tool in my toolkit. Do you know what this is? I don't, I'm hoping you're going to tell me. So I, I don't, I don't look too naive here. <laughs> this is a five gallon paint filter. Okay. $1 at a big box, uh, department store, mm -hmm. sure. uh, department store, one or two bucks for this, uh, paint filter. And what it does is it fits around um, your favorite net. So this is my fishing, this is my 
fly fishing net, the one my uncle made for me, and oh, wow. it fits around it very perfectly. Uh, and it fits around most nets, really. It's a five gallon filter, so it fits around a lot of things. And what you do is you just put it around the, the top of the net like this, and you put it in the water. And this is a tool I use a lot of my education sessions. I give this to my kids, and I say, okay, well, we're going to get in the water, and you're just going to stick this in the water and move it around. And you're going to come up with it, and then we're going to examine what bugs are in there. So the water flows through this seine. It's essentially, it's a seine. Yeah. Yep. The water flows through, and then the microorganisms, the invertebrates, the vertebrates are captured behind and are left are left on the on the seine and we can bring it up and we can examine the size the color the movement um the the variety the depth and breadth of insects that are present mm -hmm. and from there we can determine what flies we're going to make to imitate the insects that are present in the body of water that we're fishing and to any angler whether wow. you're fishing to any angler whether you're fly fishing or spin casting you if you want to catch fish, you have to present something that the fish are eating. And so this is a tool that allows you to, number one, know what is in the body of water. And that will in turn allow you to know essentially what the fish are eating, if that's, what the, if that's what's present there. So uh, a five gallon paint filter is my favorite tool in my toolbox as, a, as an angler. Wow. So... In doing so, you get a bit of a biology lesson at the same time while, while you're figuring out what's there. So that, that's super interesting. Uh, but when someone does this, they're going to pull it up, they're going to look at it, and the intent for someone new who's never done this, is it to mimic the colors? Is it to mimic the shapes? You know, what, when somebody sees all the different things that come up in the net, what should they take away from that? Because I'm sure someone's going to go and see this and then say, well, now what do I do with it? So maybe can we take it to the next level as far as what the person should do? Yep, there's four things that I've come up with in my lifetime of fishing that fish key in on. Okay. Uh, and this may be from a, from a fly fishing perspective. It may apply in other realms as well. But I focus on size, movement, color, and silhouette. Those, okay. are, the four, those are the four things that fish are going to key in on because, you know, you can present, let's say they're taking little mayflies on top of the water. Let's say they're taking size, and this can be somewhat technical, size, 18 blue winged olives which is a type of mayfly and if you cast a size 16 blue winged olive those fish might come up and look at it and then turn away got it okay. Especially if you're fishing for trout trout they're very efficient eaters they want to conserve as much energy as possible and they get this search image in their head and they the search image is a very specific mm -hmm. pattern that they're that's most prevalent in the water and that's what they're going to key in on eating just to save energy. They're not going to chase other things that might not be as prevalent. So if they see something that's not exactly what they want, they're going to turn away and go find something else. And so sometimes it's just making that small size change that will impact the, uh, impact the, the catch rate. Um, other times it's the color. You know, in the Black Hills, very few people know that we have these giant they very few people know where dragonflies come from first of all but dragonflies start off as big nymphs underwater i mean two inches long yeah yeah and our dragonfly nymphs can vary in color sometimes they're really brown sometimes they're black sometimes they're olive colored um and so sometimes that that just that little bit of difference in color will impact your catch rate and if sure, you have sure. exactly right if you know what those bugs look like and you can match that color scheme um you'll be more you'll have more of an impact in your catch rates as well. So yeah, it's those four things that, that this saying will really help you key in on size, movement, color, and silhouette. And I would encourage everyone to focus on that when you're trying to key in on a presentation. And one thing that I always tell people too, if you catch a few fish on a pattern and you know, it's starting to work, I would change it right away. Change okay. it, try something else, especially in fly fishing, because you, you always want to push the limits, right? If you know one pattern's working, then go on to something else that maybe you saw in your saying or go on to something else just a little bit different and see if those fish are still going to take it. That's just going to contribute to your learning process on that day. And it's going to, you know, you put it in your memory box for later on when you're coming back to that particular spot or you have a similar situation at hand. You can kind of bring that back and say, gosh, those fish are also taking 
you know, this uh, tongue teaser. So, um, so then I can try that on a different occasion. So it's just a, just a, that's another tip, I guess, that I do uh, that has really made me a more efficient angler um, when I go out on the water. That's fantastic. So the key takeaway is to, to mimic what you find in the water, whether it be size or color and the four things you talked about. Okay. So that, no, that, that's super helpful. Uh, I definitely like what you said about trying to change it up and learn. And obviously that's what this sport is all about is about learning. And obviously these things that we look for and the fish are going for are, are changing, you know, at all times of the year. So it's important to keep that in mind as well. So you and can do this exercise and it can be different the next time or it will be actually. And it's going to be different every in uh, across the country. You, yeah. you guys are going to have different bugs than we have. They might be the same type of bugs, mm -hmm. be the same species, but the size might be different. The color might be a little bit different. So one of my biggest pet peeves is when, you know, and you, Grant, I know they're, they're doing this um, with good intentions, but they're asking in a large message board or something, um, they're asking what fly to use. <laughs> what fly should I use for this type of fish? Well, <laughs> and then people from across the country are saying, oh, you got to use something black. Or you got to use something white. Absolutely. And I'm going to say, you need to use what is available to your fish. Find out what the fish are eating and then use something like that. We might not have similar situations. Your fish might act different than my fish. Um, there's no cookie cutter approach to fish all over. You kind of have to take it on a case by case basis. And a lot of that does just take trial and error uh, and education. Um, and there are no easy answers sometimes. Yep. Yep. And the people that look for easy answers are just lazy. Just go out and fish and do some research and you'll figure it out faster than you would if you're trying to take advice from people halfway across the country. Just go out and figure it out for yourself and you'll be a better uh, better angler at the end of the day. And now that's, that's great advice and, and I'm sure you would attest, but you know, artificial lures obviously have their place because they mimic what we're seeing in the natural environment. But as you also know, lures catch more fishermen than they do fish and it's something to remember that obviously you, you have to keep in mind that you're trying to go for the fish not for what you like so obviously if a lure looks good to you well that that's not the whole story and i, I know i can say that because i bought i've bought lures and i bought baits that i thought well, this is going to be the best one it's going to catch all kinds of fish and yeah, uh, did. uh, no it didn't work that way yeah. we've all done it. and same thing and I, that's what we one of my sayings with fly fishing as well when we're tying flies i tell the kids kids there's there's flies that catch anglers and there's flies that catch fish. Cause sometimes a fly isn't going to look good to you and you're going to, yeah. oh, this, thing, this thing is ugly. It sucks. But if you put it in front of a fish they they might love it. You do not know until you try it. So don't judge a book. Don't judge a book by its cover. Um, and the same goes for lures. You see something, see something that looks amazing. Fish could, couldn't care less about it, you know? Um, but then you see this, one of the things that works best in pier uh, and one thing that, you know, a lot of the locals, some of the locals have picked up on, but later in the summer, we're coming up on it now, the, the fish key in on really tiny, uh, flashy patterns because they're eating okay. small little shad hat uh, fingerlings. And so the tiniest little finesse minnows are called finesse, F-I-N S minnows. They're just little plastic baits, but they're only two and a half, three inches long. Mm -hmm those work the best in the summertime and there's guys out there pitching out big number, you know, big number 10 or 12 crankbaits and stuff yeah. and wondering why they're not catching fish and say, Oh, they're just not biting. No, they're just not biting on giant stuff. They're biting on little tiny silver patterns. So um, you, yeah, you really have to key in and, and, and the, those finesse minnows, it's three bucks for a huge, for a bag of them. So it's not the, it's not the flashy eight dollar Rapala on the on the stand, and I think nope. people maybe want it to be. Sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's got to be. Like, no, they want it to be flashy, just like you said for sure. And yeah. it, it doesn't always get the job done, unfortunately. But no, you know, you, you gosh, there's there's been so much good info. I, I have to go try some of those finesse worms for sure. Uh, I think I've seen them in the store and never picked them up. But of course, just as you said, they they work great out your way, but they might be terrible this way. It just depends. Yet again, it's season, it's timing, it's it's uh my terrible angler skills and i can't fish I, I but we'll get there later that that's why i'm talking to people like you to help me get to the next step here so <laughs> so now this this has been really valuable and perfect so, so thank you so much for jumping on here um is there anything else about any projects you're working on any way that 
anybody can find out about you if they want to come see you. Uh, how can they get in touch with you? How can they learn about you? And how can they support you? Well, you know, you go to fishstories.org. That's the best way to start. All my contact information is on fishstories.org. You can learn about being a true fan if it's something that you, uh, you appreciate. You can learn how to record your voice and preserve it or your voice or someone else's voice and preserve it for the future. Um, you could, I mean, heck, I do, you can even shoot me an email or something. I, I do some marketing and stuff on the side, fishingbuddystudios.com. I do a lot of content creation. Um, I do fly tying videos for uh, Hagen's Fishing, a larva lace company. And oh, they're Mitchell, South Dakota. So uh, they're on YouTube. Go to go to search for Larva Lace on YouTube, and you'll find all their fly tying videos. Those are those are all mine. Um, so if you want to learn how to tie some really good patterns that catch fish in South Dakota and probably other places, you can go there and tie those. Um, but yeah, go to fishingbuddystudios.com. My contact info's there. You can go to fishstories.org. Um, preserve your voice. And uh, my email is b s e i n e r at gmail.com. You can send me an email if you want, and or you can reach out on Facebook too, I guess. Uh, sometimes I'm not very active on Facebook, but um, send me a message and I'll try and get back to you whenever I can. And I'd love to, I'd love to chat fishing with people. I'd love to help people if I, if I can. And I'm, I'm uh, all about being a part of a great community and helping it progress and move forward. No, that's awesome. And like I said, thank you so much again for, for being a mentor to us here today. It's going to be a big help not only to me, but everybody else listening in. So can't wait to get out there and try the net trick and, and see what I can find in some of my local ponds and rivers. So that, that's going to be a big help. I'm excited to see what that comes out for me. Um, I'll leave all your contact information in the show description where people can get a hold of you if they want. And I'll leave a link to, uh, to fishing stories so they can go on and record their, their voice, which I encourage anyone listening here to do. I and mean, that's a, it's a fantastic mission. And, and, you know, maybe not even thinking about yourself, but thinking about, you know, about your kin down the line, you know, the people who, who, you know, your your sons, your daughters, your your cousins, whoever they might be, you know, they they'd love to hear you know that that's that, that fishing story one more time. Even if you're still around, you can still tell a great fishing story, and sometimes you just want to hear it. So there's there's nothing wrong with that. So I, I love what you're doing, buddy. So that, that's that's great. Yeah, I'm I'm not afraid to admit, Nate, that I go back and listen to the some some of the stories that I've created with my friends over and over and over again. There's a there's one that we recorded with the guy Snapper Dave. We call him Snapper Dave. It's on the Fish Stories archive. Uh, it's this guy that fishes for snapping turtles. <laughs> <laughs> My friend and I met him on the side of a gravel road in Northeast South Dakota one day, and we sat and we spent four hours with this guy and learned all wow. of his life. We watched him catch a turtle. We watched him shoot a turtle in the head. Uh, we talked about cleaning the turtles and eating the turtles. And uh, we talked about his, how he got up to the United States. He's from Mexico. He's an immigrant. So wow. Wow. This, this dude was super interesting. And, <laughs> and I laugh about it every single time I listen to it. So, yeah, I, I think it's a great thing for people to do. Um, I think we take, we take voices in our lives for granted sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, this, would, this would maybe help you uh, appreciate them a little bit more. If you had them on record, you had them stored. Uh, for the longevity like you said it's kind of like planting a tree you're not necessarily doing it for yourself you're doing it for the people 10 20 30 40 50 years from now um it's it's going to be really important so i appreciate you for thinking about me and having me on it's been a lot of fun oh for sure i, I know this probably won't be the only time that you're on so i know we'll, i'd like i'd love to have you back sometime in the future i, I think we both enjoy that we can get a little bit more into the detail of maybe a little fly fishing or maybe some spinning too and, and kind of break it down from there. So no, I, I'd really look forward to that here sometime in the future. So. Hey, anytime, man, you just say the word. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be ready. All right. Perfect. Well guys, I, I know I'm going to go listen to Snapper Dave's story. <laughs> I encourage everyone else to, if you want a good laugh according to Buddy's story. So, so buddy, thanks so much for coming on and we'll chat here in just a few minutes. Thanks, Nate.